that you just heard were back to back, um, at break of day and confession by Clara Kathleen Rogers. Um, we got we began this project out of quite frankly me being tired of hearing transcriptions of Nessun and Gorma being played on every instrument possible. <laughs> and particularly when I had um, a little discussion with a, a tuba player once that he insisted on breathing in all the wrong places. I'm like, you can't breathe there. That's not where you're supposed to breathe. He goes, why not? I'm not singing it. I'm like, you can't do that. So when my colleague came and said, I wish I had some pieces for um, advancing the repertoire and low brass, I said, I can help you. Because there's so much beautiful song literature out there. And I think that um, what we learn as singers about breathing is something that we had talked about as well, and it works so well together. So there are many things that we can learn from each other. So that's how this project got started. And we used a certain set of songs, um, and we used particularly the songs of Clara Kathleen Rogers. Um, I'm always on the hunt, some of you were in the other room, <laughs> the other talk, I'm always on the hunt for new literature for my singers. And so I found yet another woman that I think needs her work played. Um, and quite frankly, I think that some of them fit instrumental works better than they fit the voice with this particular um, composer. So we decided to embark on a project of working with the music of Clara Kathleen Rogers. We want to give you a little bit of information about her. She uh, was born in 1844 in England um, from a very, very musical family. That is a picture of her grandfather, Robert Lindley, who was a very famous cellist, uh, who taught at the Royal Academy of Music as he's been described as the greatest cellist of his um, generation. He was appointed to the principal cellist teacher position when the Academy first opened in 1822. Um, he also had a, a, another cousin that taught, or Clara did, who also taught at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, her mother was Eliza Lindley. Um, she was a very accomplished singer and pianist. And her father, John Barnett, um, was a Ger German Jewish uh, immigrant who was a singer, teacher, composer, and writer. And that is a picture of her father, looking very distinguished. Um, she studied at the Leipzig Conservatory uh, at piano and voice at age 12. She was the youngest student ever admitted to the conservatory at that time. They did not allow her to study composition because they didn't have a composition class for women. Um, in her memoirs, in musical, Memories of a Musical Career, she notes there was no composition for my sex, no woman composer having yet appeared on the musical horizon, with exception of Mendelssohn's sister, Fanny Hensel, who showed some talent in that direction, and Clara Schumann. None of the girl students in the conservatorium, however, had shown any, any bent for composition. Therefore, it seemed to be superfluous. Um, there also that she, she lived with um, her family in another place. She was not allowed to live at the conservatorium, so she had to find her own living quarters. Um, she was denied admission first because she was just too young. There's a story that um, she played, one of the teachers heard her at being denied admission. They came back and heard her play, and they said, we have to accept this young woman. She's just too talented not to accept her. Um, she was very good friends with Arthur Sullivan. She had a huge crush on him. And there's the young Arthur Sullivan. When I read that in her memoirs, I said, well, I need to find out what he looked like at such a young age for her to be so smitten with him. So there is the young Arthur Sullivan. She had a huge crush on him. What he did is to help her um, get some of her music out and published, particularly a string quartet. He took it and said, let me write out the parts for you and give it to my friends to help play her, play the music for her, which is really, really wonderful. She spent three years at the conservatorium, and she graduated with honors at the age of 16. And she chose to pursue an operatic career. Even though she was doing very well in piano studies, keyboard studies, she also played the violin. Um, she chose singing. She moved to Italy in 1861, made her operatic debut at 17 in Turin in the role of Princess Isabella. I love, com, <laughs> proclaimed I like this. She has not much voice, but she sings well. You know, and I really like that because we think of operatic singers with such large voices. And this, you know, I, I am a singer with a high range and but a smaller sound. 
And I went to an audition once, and the guy said, I said, well, I don't think that's what I'm meant for. And he goes, have you ever been in a concert hall in Europe? They're smaller. He said, your voice will suit that. And I think about that with her voice, that her voice, she sang well, and she could fill up the halls that she needed to do there. She performed on the stage named Clara Doria. Um, could you go back? <laughs> my, my clicker lady over here is a little <laughs> ahead of me. Um, the opera that she performed that um, debuted in was, is, if you know that Italian, it's Robert the Devil. I love that. It was actually by Maya Beer, um, who was distantly related to her father. Okay, clicker lady, you can go now. She sang leading roles in Italy from 1863 to 67. Then she returned to England to sing for four years. Um, in one of her travels, she was in the United States and toured with the Kami Bubbles and Grand English Opera Company. And she met someone there and fought, fell in love. She met Henry Rogers in 1878 and abandoned her public performing career. And can you guess why she did that? Because married ladies didn't do that. I know, it just crushes my heart, but that's what happened. Times. She did sing uh, locally in the Boston area. She specifically mentions in her memoirs singing, enjoyed singing at Trinity Church. Um, she was not happy about giving up her career, and I'll let you take a look at this, this quote. It was very moving for me. From her earliest childhood, it had been the one and only deep interest in my life was like death to me. The thought of settling down into a mere housewife and social creature with the prospect of no other than a dilettante expression in art was abhorrent. It seemed wicked to let the strivings and attainment of a lifetime go for naught, and I can't imagine how she felt to have to do all of that. But she found another outlet for her creative efforts, and she began composition and writing. She was, began publishing the Arthur P. Schmidt, which was, um, during that time, he actually published quite a few compositions by female composers. He was noted for, for doing that. If you were having difficulty having another place for your composition, you could go to him, and he was a strong advocate for women composers at that time. In the Boston area, she had many, many friends, um, well-known musicians and art authors. Amy Beach was one of her friends. Um, Margaret Lang, George Jacker, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Amy Lowell, Henry Wordsworth Longfellow, those were all of her, her friends. He wrote, uh, Longfellow wrote, um, Stay at Home, My Heart, and Rest, particularly for Rogers, and she said that was one of her compositions that she said. Um, she held weekly music house in her home to help foster not only her work, but the work of her friends. Um, she re rejected, when the New England Conservatory first approached her about teaching for them, she rejected that idea and said, no, that's not what I am meant to do. But later she did agree to it, and she joined the faculty of the New England Conservatory in 1902 as a professor of singing, not composition. She published quite she, uh, a number of books on singing, philosophy of singing, which is out as a Google download uh, if you're interested in reading that. It, it is interesting to me to go back to, as a singer and teacher of singing, to go back and look at the historical perspectives of singing and how we approach things today. And it's very interesting because those key concepts of breath, support, resonance are all there. Nothing has changed in that regard. Uh, the, my voice and I, I love her diction books, English Diction Song and Speech, English Diction Part One, uh, the voice and speech. They're very written from a first person narrative as well, which is interesting to me. She's very specific on how she wants things done. Her memoirs, as I said, uh, memoirs of the musical career are wonderful. And I love also her journal letters from the Orient. Those are very interesting. Um, this is a review from the philosophy about from the musical times in September 1894 about her philosophy of singing. This 200 pages is worthy of the attention of every vocalist and teacher to the student. It will impart knowledge of the greatest importance to the experienced vocalist who will provide food for profitable thought. To the teacher, the facts it sets forth are invaluable. And it is. It's a really wonderful book of, of her philosophy of singing. She wrote over 100 songs. Um, only three that I can find have been recorded. All Love But a Day, one of the, the best known recordings from Suzanne Nenser, Out of My Own Great Woe, and Apparitions by Linda Dykstra, those are some names that you may know. She does have a number of piano works, 
string quartets, a sonata for violin and piano, and a sonata for cello and piano. And a cello sonata um, is, I think it would be a, a nice work for both um, professional pianist and cellist to work from. Um, and it is available in print. Um, I just received, I have a copy of it on my desk at the moment, and I would, I would love to work it up. Do I, we haven't decided if it works for trombone or not. <laughs> We're thinking about that. Um, her, library, her archives are housed at the University Library, Harvard University. They took all of her works and had a nice collection. At one time, they had a room specifically devoted to her up on the second floor, I believe. I don't know that that was still there. Um, but she had a lovely life of singing and music making and passed away in 1931. So, back to our transcription project because that's what this all, how this all began. Um, so, my fabulous colleague over there um, went to, uh, this is I guess his third year, but went for the first year by, to the Women by Music Festival at uh, University of Mississippi Women's University for Women in Columbus, Mississippi. That's a mouthful and a half. The Music by Women Festival, I've seen some of you there too. Um, and um, so she went and then came back and said, we need to, to do more things with uh, women composers. And it wasn't honestly, when I look back on it now, um, Outside of the piece when I played when I was in high school, which is March of the Tadpoles by Toshiko Akiyoshi, and I've conducted a few pieces by Julie Giroux, but Clara Kathleen Rogers is the next only woman composer I've ever performed on, I've, I've ever played music of. You know, it's it not for any other reason, and I'm 42, and <laughs> I started playing when I was 10. Not for any other reason other than just literally accessibility for low brass, for, for just low brass composers. Are, 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 usually white European males. <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, so how it goes in our repertoire. Um, so it was an opportunity to, to, to spotlight a female composer. It's all in public domain, we love that. So um, that's, that, that was great. And then it was about finding repertoire. Many of our students come to us, they're first generation American students. Um, they're a senior in high school, and we actually have another presentation. I love band, I love choir, I think I'll be a music major. We get a lot of those <laughs> students. And so um, the repertoire that I just spoke to you of those fabulous European um, uh, composers, um, we start with the Morceau Symphonique or the David Concertino. We start with repertoire that is well beyond their, their um, abilities as seniors in high schools coming to, to music for the first time in college. So I was looking for a repertoire that still was really beautiful and uh, along the lines of what we do as low brass players in general, which is to work from the Janusz Roszu and or the Bordoni vocalises. And I wanted pieces that were art songs and um, very playable, but also very beautiful. I could teach lyrical playing and things like that. Um, and then, like I said, they're very tuneful and of course the opportunity to expand our low brass repertoire. I mean, uh, you know, in being in all honesty, I, I have performed Ness and Dorma <laughs> in front of the, I said that was my brass band debut in California, but, uh, but it is important to expand a re repertoire for us because our repertoire is still with only 120, 130 years old. And so finding a repertoire that allows us to kind of steal from a genre that is appropriate to, to our instrument is important. One of the things that we know is we teach at a university that is small, it's considered rural, even though Fort Smith is a, is a nice sized town. Um, we draw from all the small schools around us, very, very bad. So I, even as a singing teacher, I find that I will ask them, what solos have you sung? Very few of them have sung a solo. They like choir, so they're going to be a music major, literally. And Alex was finding the same thing. They may have played an instrumental solo as part of solo and ensemble if they came from our big schools within the city. But out in the outliner, they've never played a solo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and um, the range of, of, the, of, the, of the music stays in a really nice and practical range. And we have transcribed, um, we have put them in some different keys. But even in doing so, it still has about, like it says, an octave and a fifth of a range. One has an octave and a, and a, and a, and a seventh, but you know. <laughs> Just in case all of you theorists out there are playing <laughs> well, I heard that one, one, <laughs> one, one, one. Um, so, so we chose, as, in fact, it, it's kind of funny because there, there are a lot more songs, but these are the ones that we've chosen for now and we're actually still working through, through other ones. Just out of curiosity, that's, yeah, okay, I wanted to go back to make sure I had that. 
So um, today we played at Break of Day and um, Confession. And for the last, in fact, that was the first time, uh, if you had heard our presentation before, you would have heard them on the opposite instruments. Because for the last year, we've been, I've been playing the, at Break of Day on trombone and Confession on euphonium. And in you know, finding repertoire, yes, it's great to expand the repertoire and, um, and you know, all of that stuff. But at the same time, we want the piece to sound natural on that instrument. And literally for the last year, we've been going, what's wrong with it? This, this, the, at break of day, it just didn't sit right. Didn't work. You know, it, and I'm like, well, maybe we'll make it higher, you know, because uh, both of those pieces are actually in the mid register of, of the trombone and the euphonium. And, and um, I myself, I, I'm, I'm what they call the light lyric trombonist over here, where <laughs> I spend a lot of my career playing very high. You know, that's just a lot of the French solos and repertoire that we have is, is, is quite high. And so that kind of sits kind of in the, in the middle bulk meat of my of my range, and I was thinking, well, maybe we'll make it higher next time, or well, maybe we'll make it lower, and I'll play it on bass trombone or something. But then, uh, literally yesterday, um, we we switched them. So that was the first time we've performed those, even though we've performed these other ones before on those instruments. And as soon as I started at break of day on euphonium, I went, and I was that solves. We don't have to change. Right. Yeah, we don't have to change keys. We don't have to do anything. We just yes. it just needs to be on a different instrument. And that was the other part of the project, of really finding great song repertoire, but repertoire that fits the instrument so the students can feel that when they're performing. Because oftentimes, with more challenging solos, um, their technique, they're, they're trying to learn technique in the solo. And that's not always very helpful. And so this allows the student to have a really easy, an easy way about making music is, uh, is the goal. A goal that they can re immediately find gratification from great, tuneful music rather than having to struggle through perhaps some of their difficulties and their limitations of their technique at that moment. So. Um, <clears throat> we, we did change some things. Actually, the piano part's probably the thing we ch you changed the most. We really tried to stay um, as true as we could to the composer's intent, <laughs> except for we were taking it away from the, the voice and put it on an instrument. Um, but the, the, the melodies are generally the same. There are some ryth rhythms that we, we modify a little bit. Um, Alex mentioned the key. We had to find the keys that we think could work best, and we played around with that a lot, and to get the right sound for the, the right piece. Um, and that was important, to find, to find the right key. Yeah, and it was, too, to also um, stretch the, even though we, it went from E to D, it's still in a key that the middle section of that other piece was in D major. And, and that was important, too, because, again, as a low brass player, you know, they can spend a good deal from, if they begin in fifth grade or seventh grade, wherever they, wherever they begin until twelfth grade, in B flat, B flat, and F. You know, and so then finding some repertoire that does venture out into D, that's not too scary, but there are some sharps and, so it also expands the repertoire for them that way too. Um, and we got going. The, the, I mentioned the, the text-driven um, rhythm. Some of that we modify. Uh, the breathing, of course, I am like you have to take some breaths here because I. That's to me that's important. The composer intended for you to do that, so we did that. And then, I'm sorry. yeah, no, and then I think that that was important too because oftentimes when we do low brass players and, and brass players and maybe other instruments, I don't know the rest of you guys so well, but I know brass players. We do still repertoire from, from vocal music because mostly we love the tunes, we love the melodies. But um, in here we really try to, and in, when we print these, it'll have the breath marks where the breath marks are for the text. Because as a brass player, there are several times where I just like, like and she's like, you can't breathe there. I'm like, what do you mean I can't breathe there? I want to breathe there. <laughs> you know, she's like, well, there's a word in there. And so really, as a brass player, it really made me like, oh, what, what is that word? That's right, you're right, I can't breathe in the middle of that word. And so it also helps me to extend that lyrical part of my playing, thinking about the text and those things. And finally, the most, the, the more, the most changes have been in the piano. Um, very often, Clara will follow the melody at school lucidly, so I would try to vary that to make it more interesting. Um, I would add a third, I would go to my third instead of taking the, um, her uh, pitches, but rhythmically and pitch, we changed a good bit of the piano to just make it simply more interesting. And uh, we have just enough time to play you two more of her songs. We're going to end with Nothing, and finally, The Clover Blossom. So this is uh, this nothing is one that we we, we put in a, in a key that gives it a little bit more friendly to the euphonium than its original. 